there was something inside me that was still fighting. There was the will was still there. So although my mind had mentally checked out of life, Liz McConaughey was still in there and that tenacity, that little girl who was still running the race, didn't want to give up. So I think that's probably how I ended up making that phone call. I said, I don't remember it, but some, you know, my subconscious took over and, and, and did. So I remember coming out of hospital a couple of days later and feeling almost euphoric, like, well, it's not going to get any worse than this. You know, I've hit rock bottom. That is as bad as it can go. And actually, I was very wrong. You know, I'd, essentially, the lid had come off that day and all the files of my entire life had tipped all over the floor. And now I had to go through the journey of putting them all back. And is your book gives an incredibly honest and humbling account of your struggles with mental health. Tell us what prompted you to write the book. So the book was, um, yeah, it was born out of a very dark time in my life, as you've alluded to. Um, so when I left the forces, I was medically discharged because I developed a, a, a neck injury, which is essentially from flying 3,000 hours on the back of a very vibrating aircraft and doing that physical job I was talking about earlier. And it did just take a toll on my body eventually. Um, and despite the RAF offering me a desk job, I mean, I joined the RAF to fly. So I, I did try it for a month or so and went, no, I just want to leave. So I took a medical discharge and left. And, and we spoke briefly earlier about, you know, that lack of purpose all of a sudden and that lack of identity. And that, you know, rolled through 2019 into 2020. And I thought I was coping with it really well. You know, I'd suddenly, you know, I'd find our ability. I came to work here which was amazing and it gave me that absolute new sense of purpose and I felt, you know, was, I mean, the Arability family is almost like the Air Force family. They absolutely embraced me. The banter in the crew room was just like being in the RAF and everyone's really, you know, great sense of humour was just like being on the squadron. So I felt like I was in a really good place. And then in 2020, Boris locked us all down because of COVID and suddenly all the coping mechanisms that I'd used through all the time that I'd seen trauma in the forces um, were gone. So things I did, which is the same as many people really was, you know, keep busy, chat to friends, go to the pub, decompress with your mates about stuff you've seen or done. Um, I did a lot of running and I was spent a lot of time at the gym and that was my way of emptying the bucket at the end of the day. Go for a run. You know, I used to come back from some really nasty merch shouts in Afghanistan and just go running. And it was like my Forrest Gump moment of just get rid of it all out of your head. And when we got locked down, I couldn't do any of that. And I was living on my own. And suddenly the silence was deafening. You know, I only had my own thoughts to sort of wallow and, and fester in. And as the year went on of, of 2020, I, I started to unwind very quickly. Um, and I knew it was happening. And that's the irony is that I could feel these behaviours, patterns changing in myself. You know, suddenly, I'd, even when we came out of the first lockdown, I didn't suddenly start going running again. I would get dressed in my Leica every day and go and look at my bike. And then I'd go, no, not today, back to bed. And I would spend all day in bed from someone who used to do Ironman triathlons to suddenly can't even get motivated to get out of bed. And I think normally people would have noticed that behavior, but because we were still in that like, in and out of lockdown and I lived on my own, I hit it really well and I never let on to anyone where I was going with it. To the point where uh, it sort of really got to its height in August that year where I was suffering from insomnia, was really struggling to sleep. And that is like the worst thing ever because you're in your th thoughts 24 seven then. And I started looking up a lot of the soldiers that I picked up on the merch sites in Afghanistan. And, and one thing we always were really careful to do out in Afghanistan was not follow up the stories of those guys because we knew it would be quite detrimental to our mental health. And suddenly I found myself doing it, you know, Googling them and finding out, you know, if they were gay, if they had kids, what were their family like? And that was and humanizing them. And that was very dangerous to the point where I woke up in August and I woke up one day and just, the, just decided that today was the day I was going to end my life. It was like an out-of-body experience. It was almost like I just by that point mentally checked out of life. I spent the whole day planning it meticulously. I actually reached out for help from the GP that morning um, and all I was prescribed was some pills to help me, um, which turned out to be a lethal dose of pills that I later on took that night. But I had absolutely gone to the departure line of life at that day. You know, no one could have stopped me. I, you know, look back now and I, you know, speak to my mom at length about this and even if Daniel Craig, I said, had come round for dinner that night, nothing could have stopped me because I was already in that place. Um, and all I wanted to do was stop the marble that was rolling around in my head all day. So I took a huge overdose in, in August that year, uh, 
thankfully um, survived. Uh, I didn't know how. I woke up in intensive care in Basingstoke three days later on a life support machine with a tube down my throat. Uh, and it turned, it was only when I then subsequently got out of hospital and I was reunited with my phone, I found out that I'd actually called the Samaritans initially for about 13 seconds. Don't remember any of this. Um, and then called 911 at uh, 10 to 1 in the morning and was on the phone to them for about 15 minutes. That must have been then how the ambulance crew found me. So clearly there was something coming back to the tenacity that we were talking about earlier. There was something inside me that was still fighting. There was the will was still there. So although my mind had mentally checked out of life, Liz McConaughey was still in there and that tenacity, that little girl, he was still running the race, didn't want to give up. So I think that's probably how I ended up making that phone call. I say I don't remember it, but some, you know, my subconscious took over and, and, and did. So I remember coming out of hospital a couple of days later and feeling almost euphoric, like, well, it's not going to get any worse than this. You know, I've hit rock bottom. That is as bad as it can go. And actually, it was very wrong. You know, I'd, essentially, the lid had come off that day and all the files of my entire life had tipped all over the floor. And now I had to go through the journey of putting them all back into my head. And I spent the next 18 months really through. I was very lucky as a veteran that I went straight into the mental health system of the veterans. Uh, so I had like help for heroes and PTSD resolutions. And I know that the civilian mental health system is not that and uh, not as good, mostly because of underfunding, not because of people not wanting to help. So I was very lucky and I got straight into the PTSD counselling and essentially went through all of the trauma that I'd seen in my time in Afghanistan and reading it, you know, acknowledging it, thinking back to the events and accepting that it's okay to want to cry about that and that, you know, the hardened girl that I'd become for 17 years, you know, chipping on the eggshell and letting the egg crack is okay. Because I think before I thought, well, if the egg cracks, that's failure. And actually it's not. Like a letting emotion show is a really human thing to do. And, you know, I spent 18 months kind of going through that. And as part of that, started to write. Uh, I did, originally did poetry and then, and then turned my hand to writing the book. <laughs> and it was very much like a cathartic experience of kind of going back through all that trauma again and going back to the start. And uh, three weeks later, I had this, this book. So I was like walking with a civvy friend one day and said, um, I think I've written a book, don't laugh. And she said, that's amazing. Send me it. So I emailed it to her. She read it and said, I think this is really good. You should send it to a publisher. And I did. And, and lo and behold, a year later, it's on the streets and it's on the table, which still blows my mind. But that book, you know, was very much the catharticness of just me just getting everything that was destructively running around in my head out onto paper. And it's worked. You know, I feel like I am absolutely out the other side of that. And I think a really strong message I, I want anyone watching this is to, you can have I mean, mental health is something we should embrace it all the time, 365 days a year. But you can have mental trauma in your life and you can have mental issues, but it doesn't have to, you know, be an anchor around you forever. You know, you can have it, you can deal with it, you can process it, same with PTSD. And it doesn't have to be your new label. I, I definitely had PTSD. I spent two years getting through it. But with the help of family, friends, air ability, you know, I've come out the other side of that into a really positive space in life. Um, and I think a really key message is to take some of the really bad times in your life and the really dark times and, and use them to help other people in the future, which is hopefully what I'm doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what advice would you give to somebody who is struggling with their mental health at the moment? So don't do what I did, <laughs> which is hold it all in. I mean, if I had accepted, again, it was that hardened shell that I was at that time. You know, I didn't want to admit weakness because I thought weakness was failure. And it's absolutely not. Weakness is human. And, uh, you know, you don't fall over and scratch your knee and expect it not to bleed. It's going to bleed because that's what humans do. Uh, and it's the same with mental health. You know, if you, you know, fall over and you, you know, you damage it in any way or it gets damaged, you know, it's going to break. But just talk to people, um, you know, talk early to people. And when you feel yourself getting into that spiral, you know, f even if you can't talk to a close friend, talk to a stranger. I mean, one thing I've learned now coming out to the other side of it and through my counselling is that some of these mental health charities have numbers you can text because sometimes even just making a phone call is really hard. So you can text numbers and certainly Veterans Gateway have got one and Combat Stress have got one. Um, and that's so much easier for sometimes people find. Um, and I started to give my mental health a, a number, one to 10. And I think that's a really good message for people is that I now see people and I say, how are you doing today? And we're all guilty of this. We all go, yeah, fine. Living the dream used to be a favorite in the forces. And actually, if you ask twice, you know, if you say, are, are you actually okay? 
Um, that, that's sometimes enough to break the eggshell for someone. Um, but I ask a lot of my friends now, okay, scale of one to 10, where, where are we at today? And sometimes people are like, I'm seven or an eight. Sometimes people say two, and it's easier for them just to say a number. And then you can open that conversation of, well, how do we get you to a six or a seven? Or why are you at a two? And that just opens the conversation of talking. To, I think that's really, really important. Um, and we do say it all the time, but it is so important just to talk and not feel like you're letting people down because you're human. And talk to me about resilience then, because throughout this story, you've shown so much tenacity and resilience. What does resilience mean to you? And how do you think people can develop their resilience so that they can work through any challenging scenarios that they're dealing with at the moment? So I think it'd be very easy for someone to hear the word resilience and think resilience means never failing and never, you know, not surviving at stuff. But I think the more important way to look about resilience is actually failing, but taking the positives away from that failure. And that's certainly, you know, my resilience has always been there, but I did fail at one point. And it's about taking that, you know, that bad event and pulling the positives out of it. And that's where real resilience come in because we all fail, you know, um, and that's where I think sometimes resilience can get the wrong definition. And it's not that at all. It's about taking the positives and continuing to move forward in life. So Liz, talk to me about a support network. How important do you think it is to draw on sources of support around you? So absolutely key. I think, you know, I think that's where, you know, case in point that year of 2020, when we all lost our support network, didn't we? We were all isolated by, by Boris and everyone's support network went and a lot of people suffered that year. But I, now that we're out of that, certainly my veterans are, are you know, my co ex-colleagues from, from the Chinook fleet are absolutely key in having put me back together. But I have to say, AirAbility, because I, I, I still worked for AirAbility at the time when all this was going on. Um, whenever I came back to work, I was back. I mean, Mike Miller-Smith was just amazing. And actually, the day that I took the overdose, I woke up that morning and like I mentioned, I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I was just, you know, watching my life through a lens the whole day. And we had a 10 o'clock Zoom every day for our ability during lockdown, which was mostly just to keep that community going so that we're all checking in on each other. And we just chat about banter and, you know, just talk nifting up and triv most of the time. But Mike noticed that morning that I was different on that Zoom call. And the next day when I didn't make the 10 o'clock Zoom call, Mike knew something was wrong and he had a spidey sense, he still says now, that there was just something was going on. And I was obviously at this point lying in intensive care in, in Basingstoke Hospital. And he actually sent Harvey from Aerobility around to my apartment to, to find me. And Harvey met my best friend who had arrived at the same time. And I wasn't in the apartment because I was at the hospital. But, but Mike knew that. Mike felt that in his bones. And I think, you know, it's really key when we're talking about support networks. And I mentioned about, you know, asking your friends, scale of one to ten. Your friends and your family are the people who will pick up those subtle differences in you. They're the people who will know that if you're always at the gym, you're suddenly not at the gym, or if you're always at the pub on a Friday night, suddenly you stop going. Your friends and your closest allies are the people that will pick that up. So it's really key to look for that in others. And, and Mike Miller-Smith noticed that straight away. Um, but I remember coming back to work a few weeks later and our ability were amazing. Um, but I've, I was sat at my desk and, you know, there was, everyone in the room had a disability of some form. And I always remember feeling very privileged to be, you know, able-bodied and amongst all these other people who were absolutely outstanding uh, individuals and very humbled to be working with them. But that particular day, I remember thinking, God, I'm the most broken person in this room, but I don't feel like my, like my disability is valid because it's not as bad as a broken leg or a missing leg or a you know, cerebral palsy or any of the other disabilities that I'm surrounded by. But it really is, you know, I, I was the one I remember having a pinch moment after thinking that, going, yeah, but you're, you're the one who tried to kill yourself, Liz, and you're the one who, it can be just as destructive having a mental illness or disability as a physical one. And I think that's a really strong message people need to accept and acknowledge, really. And, you know, just because it's invisible doesn't mean it's just as debilitating as anything that's physical. So, uh, yeah, and it, it really, you know, it was a very humbling experience, I think, to go through. Um you know, suddenly feeling very vulnerable with, with that. And to anybody who's feeling vulnerable or who's feeling that they're struggling to manage their anxiety and that it's holding them back from doing what they want to do in life, what advice would you give to them? Be open and honest about it. The more open and honest I've been about my mental struggles and my mental health, and, 
you know, there we case in point, you know, 17 year veteran, war zones up the yin yang, you know, done two deployments to Iraq, 17 deployments to Afghanistan. You don't expect me to be sat here going, yeah, I crumbles and I nearly killed myself and I really struggled with mental, my, struggled with my mental health. Um, and it's the more open you are to people, the more people are open with you. And certainly, suddenly since the books come out, I've had messages on a weekly basis of people who've gone, it struck a chord with me, Liz, and I've struggled with this. And these are complete strangers and people I've never met before. But it seems to just be opening up that two-way flow of information and chatting to people. And, and I think that's, you know, really key is that don't be afraid of being honest and open about it because you'll be surprised if you say, you come into work one day, go, guys, I'm really struggling today. Nearly nine out of 10 people in the room will be like, oh my God, I'm so glad you said that. I've had a shocker. But people won't say it until you open the door. So just be open about it because we're all human. Absolutely. And one of the things I like, um, towards the end of your book, you talk about how you've managed your, um, your struggles and one of the ways you've dealt with that moving forward is to be kind to yourself. So talk to me about how important you think it is that we practice kindness and gratitude. Yeah, I think I got to the point where I'd become so immune to the emotion. I say I couldn't even look in the mirror and like myself anymore. You know, I couldn't. That girl staring back at me, the same girl from, you know, pre-joining the Air Force. I didn't like her. I just couldn't find myself to love her. And you almost have to, you know, again, really look inside at the good points that you've got about yourself and uh, write them down but yeah to then be kind and have that positive language and it's really important to always you know there's certain things I used to say to myself that I would never have dreamt of saying to my worst enemy but yet it felt okay to say them to me internally and I think that's a really important message is that you know just look after yourself the same way you'd look after your best friend because you're worthy of it and that's really important. So talking about being part of a team you mentioned in your book the Liz who always tries to please everybody. Tell me though how you found that with versus sometimes having to say no to things so that you don't overload your stress bucket and how important or how difficult it can be to say no. Yeah. I mean I was the, I was classic that. I was like, yeah, I'll just do anything for anyone because I want to be liked. I think everyone wants to be liked, don't they? And you feel like if you do anything that anyone asks you, then you'll be liked. Um and I find that during uh, when I was going through my PTSD counselling, one of the things I've always wanted to do in my life was walk at this March at the Cenotaph at Remembrance Sunday. I've always wanted to do it. And last year, the Mert team from Afghanistan, it was their inaugural year. So they had only just been formed. They were all marching at the Cenotaph. It was a lot of old, old colleagues from the Chinook Force and all the medics and the doctors that I worked with so closely, you know, picking up veterans off the battlefield. And uh, I'd been asked to go and walk. You know, it was a real privilege. And it's like, well, it's bucket list. It's a privilege to be asked. There was all the security that went, you know, you had to go through to get there. And on the Wednesday beforehand, I had an absolute meltdown, huge anxiety attack. Woke up in the middle of the night, just overwhelmed with almost my self-pressure. You know, I so ex wanted to go, but it was almost too consuming. And I made the really hard decision on the Thursday uh, and pulled out and, and told Charlie, who was the medic that was coordinating it all, I, I just can't go. And she said, seven people have pulled out this week. You know, felt the same overwhelming emotion. And it was a self-preservation, you know, choice that day, you know. But I remember really racking with the guilt of going, you should go. You know, you, you should be going because you want to go. And, and a friend, I quitted it to this, he said, it's like having an allergy to, to pizza, for example, is, you know, everyone else is having a slice of pizza. You want a slice of pizza. But you know, if, they, if you eat the pizza, it's going to make you sick. So, you know, but you have this internal anxiety of like, oh, but I want a bit, but I know it's going to make me sick, but I want to. And, and I really struggled that, you know, that week of like, I should go, but I can't go. And, and actually the best thing I did was say no. And, you know, I had a really great remembrance Sunday that year because I just spent it on my own and, and remembered in my own way. But I was able to go this year. And I think, you know, sometimes you have to make those calls early to say no to stuff in a self-preservation way so that you can play the long game. And, you know, there's no point in breaking yourself early. And one of my favorite sayings my mom always tells me is, you can't pour from an empty cup. And it is so true. You know, if you don't look after yourself, you can't help others. You have to fit your own oxygen mask first, don't you? And there's no point in running yourself into the ground and just doing stuff for all the other people if you're not actually looking after yourself. So Liz, you've had an incredible story so far. But if you could write a letter and post it back to young Liz 
on day one of joining the Air Force? Good question. What would you say? Wow. Uh, I'd probably say start taking notes now because maybe one day you'll write a book about it. (laughs) And I never really catalogued my military career. I was really bad at taking pictures and journaling or doing any of that stuff. I mean, I've got my logbooks. But I think I'd, I'd probably tell her that it's okay to be a girl sometimes. It's okay to cry and it's okay to admit that you might need help. Because I think if I'd have got that message into my own head quite early on, instead of, you know, again, it comes back that resilience is a great thing, but sometimes it can be the undoing of, you know, I'm so, so desperate to be so resilient. And it was such a, a strong personality trait in myself that I didn't let the cracks kind of show through. And, you know, sometimes not only do the cracks, you know, I say show through like it's a bad thing, but sometimes they can shine through and the stuff that's inside can shine out of the cracks. And I think that's a really important message. But yeah, just admit that it's okay to not be okay <laughs> and ask for help because no one's ever going to judge you for asking for help. Sometimes people actually want to be asked for help. And um, and I think I've probably made more solid friendships in the last two years through asking for help for people um, who genuinely want to, you know, get me back on my feet and get me back on my journey. And that's really, you know, that's really key. So if you could change one thing about the world... With your story in mind, what would that be? I think um, the military have got this saying about lessons identified. At the end of any exercise or anything we ever do, we take a note of all the things that we've learned. And I think, I mean, I think even air ability, we used to do it at the end of the air show or whatever, you'd learn all the things. And, and sometimes they go in a file somewhere on a computer or in a filing cabinet. And it's all really great learning those things, but you have to do something about them. And, you know, at the start of any planning exercise for the military, it should be the first thing you should do is pull out the folder from last year. What did we learn? And mental health certainly is something where the military are starting to learn mostly the hard way through a lot of veteran suicides. And, you know, that's not just the military. I think the civilian world at the minute, you know, suicide rates are through the roof and mental health is is really destructive for so many people. And But we all know it's there because it's becoming, you know, forefront of many people's minds. So if we know it's there, let's start doing something about it. And, you know, not just acknowledging that it's there, but let's start doing something and actioning and, and, you know, implementing maybe mental health training for certainly basic recruits going into the military. You know, teaching them about resilience is good, but you don't also have to be unbreakable. You know, you're allowed to break and that's okay. And the same for kids at school. You know, I think it's really important. Um for kids to understand mental health and you know because they're you know pretty perceptive kids from a very young age and you know we kind of shield them I think from a lot of mental health certainly the stories in my book you know it's not I almost say to some people don't let your kids read it until they're older and then I'm thinking well why am I saying that because it's probably a really important lesson for kids to learn when they're young that you can have these moments of breaking and failure and come out the other side of it but you have to talk. So Liz, your story is truly inspiring, but what's next for Liz? I've I've loved writing the book. It's been a a real, it was born out of a really dark time in life and it's been um, a kind of a surprise of how well it's done. But writing is really my passion now. And it's coming back to that, like redefining your purpose thing, I feel like really now. Although I did go to um, a a book festival recently and I was there as an author to just to talk. And I remember thinking, I'm not an author. Oh, yeah, I've written a book, but I'm still not an author. (laughs) But it is my passion, and I really want to write a sequel to the book. Um, There's 17 chapters in the book, and I served in 18 Squadron for my most of my career, actually. Um, And I'm really keen to try and capture uh, the stories of the Squadron members from 18 Squadron. So I'd love the next book to be called Chapter 18, Their Stories. And I think nearly everyone on the planet's got a book in them. It's just having the time to write it. And there was, you know, so many different people looking at the same version of war as I was. You know, they're all in the same place at Camp Bastion and, and seeing the same events most days, but everyone had a very different perception of it. So I'd love to capture, you know, the you know squadron commander's view on things because he was probably more concerned about, you know, taking 60 people out to Afghanistan and bringing 60 people home. Um, and the engineers were probably more worried about getting that aircraft ready so that it was there for us for Mert. You know, the... The safety equipment guy that fixed our helmets every day, you know, he would see us go out to merch out and then come back and, you know, would see us all covered in blood or our heads falling because we'd had a bad day and could do nothing about it. So he probably felt quite helpless. And I'd just love to be able to capture all those different views of the same war. So hopefully that's the next book. Bit of a spoiler. 
Um, and then I write a lot of poetry as well. So I really love to get the poetry, um, the poetry published. And then obviously when Tom Cruise gets hold of the book, I'd love to make a movie out of it. So if anyone's got Tom Cruise's number, they can <laughs> send him a copy of the book. And yeah. someone suggested it should be called Top Gunner, which I thought was a little bit too cheesy. But uh, yes, if Tom's watching, get in touch. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much for your time today. Your story is humbling to listen to. Thank you so much for the vulnerability and honesty you have shown. And hopefully that will be of some help to any of our listeners or viewers. But I have one small final request. I don't go in. <laughs> can you please sign my book? Yeah, I can sign it. I should have brought a crayon, but instead I got my airability pen, which I do carry everywhere with me. Yeah, of course. It'd be an honour to you. And thank you for having me today. It's been an absolute privilege. You're very welcome. <laughs> Always write this in my signings. Per Ardua ad Astra which is the RAS model and very relevant.